Good evening and welcome on behalf of Champions for Children and the Lori Center for Children's Social and Emotional Wellness. Thank you for attending this evening's webinar, The State of Children's Mental Health, Lifting Children Up by Lifting Up Their Helpers. My name is Maureen Diamond. I'm Vice President of Finance for Adventist Healthcare. I've been with Adventists for over 22 years, and I've had the privilege of working with the Lori Center since they joined our system in 2007. It's been amazing to watch the growth of the Lori Center during the last 16 years. I am also a proud member of Champions for Children. Before we continue, I want to mention that this program is being recorded and will be available after the event. Champions for Children is a network of women who inspire, influence, and leverage experience and relationships to move from awareness to action in addressing our national children's mental health crisis. Our goal is to help raise funds and support the Lori Center as a national model of early intervention success. We have many of our champions in attendance tonight. In recognition of Children's National Mental Health Awareness Day, please join me in welcoming our distinguished and nationally renowned experts, Isabel Howe, Pamela Cantor, MD, and Dr. Dana Winters, who will discuss the state of children's mental health and how we lift children up by providing encouragement and support to their helpers including parents, teachers, therapists, and all others who work to ensure every child can live life to the fullest. Before the program begins, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jimmy Venza. Jimmy is the Executive Director of the Lori Center for Children's Social and Emotional Wellness, a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the social and emotional health of young children and families through prevention, clinical intervention, education, research, and training. The Lori Center is co-hosting today's webinar. Dr. Benza joined the Lori Center in 2003 to complete his postdoctoral training in the therapeutic nursery and parent-child clinical services programs. Dr. Benza has extensive clinical experience with children adolescents, and families from diverse ethnic and socioeconomic populations, often dealing with trauma, abuse, crisis management, and a wide range of mental health issues. He presents research and provides professional training in early childhood trauma, attachment, and the integration of mental health and education locally, nationally, and internationally. He has provided consultation in Haiti, and the Kingdom of Lusutu, focusing on the impact of trauma and building resiliency with children, caregivers, and professionals. Dr. Venza earned a bachelor's degree in anthropology and history from the University of Notre Dame, a doctorate degree in clinical psychology from Long Island University's Brooklyn campus, and earned a postgraduate certificate in child and Adolescent Psychotherapy from the Washington School of Psychiatry. Jimmy will introduce our moderator for the program, and please help me in welcoming Dr. Jimmy Venza. Hey, thank you so much, Maureen. Uh, much appreciated. And, um, you know, Maureen and I, we've been now like 20 years uh, working together, and Maureen's always there in the background and, and now has really stepped forward for our Champions for Children and as a founding member and, and really carrying the message first in meetings and first in support. And so uh, Maureen, just so great that you could um, open us uh, up today and, and start off our important hour and a half together. Mm -hmm. 
it's a nexus point we're really at uh, when we think of um, in society, the, the, the early childhood trauma crisis that predated COVID and now COVID, which has raised that profile even more. And then in a fun nexus, it's National Children's Mental Health Day today. Um, and, it, and it happens that it falls on Teacher Appreciation Week. So those things seem to go right together. Um, and as, as you'll hear, the program, part of our emphasis is how do we help the helpers? And so I can raise my hand. I'm one of the helpers that has been helped. Um, so I came to Lori Center 20 years ago and, and have been trained here and uh, supported by supervisors and colleagues and, and of course, children and families. Um, at Lori Center, we say it's one family growing together. So child, parents, uh, caregivers, and professionals. And it's been 41 years. So 1982, the Lori Center was founded as a National Institute for Mental Health Research Study. Um, the leaders, you know, Dr. T. Barry Brasleton, St Stanley Greenspan, Reg Lori, and a lot of other um, wonderful leaders, especially our women leaders, uh, Dr. Betty Ann Gaplin, Georgia DeGanchi, uh, Mary Robinson, and, and others, um, really launched the center um, as a way to really provide support for children and families and bring the best developmental science to families and community and really learn from children and families. You can kind of think of Lori Center as four principles of attachment-centered, trauma-informed, equity-advancing, team-based care. So really all that, that kind of the, the, the basis of team-based care is really what we're going to be talking about today. Because um, when you're dealing with difficult experiences for families and adults and also for children, it takes a really big team um, and a really specialized team. So on the call, some of some of our team members are on the call. And so we, we have an outpatient mental health clinic, a therapeutic preschool, special education elementary school, our Head Start program, which includes early Head Start, um, and our early intervention uh, program, uh, which we partner with Montgomery County for. And then we what we call our big hug research and training. Uh, it's all part of that and, and really partnering with the early childhood care continuum. So that's government, non-government, philanthropic, and other educational community-based organizations, all with one goal in mind, which is to help children and families overcome uh, adversity and, and lead their, their best life. Um, and we know that that, especially now with the pressures, you can, lots of different adjectives, unprecedented, immense, overwhelming pressures on, on caregivers and, and on the helpers. Um, it's incumbent on all of us to work, continue to work together and lean in about intervent, in innovation and intervention, about how do we help make sure we're continuing to change trajectory in a positive direction. So it's um, uh, my big smile is part of that is, is about to unfold, which is you're going to hear from this amazing team. So Pam, Dana, and Isabel, who are gonna share their experiences to, um, of, of how we do this work together. And, uh, and, and we're gonna learn from them today. And so first, it's my great joy is to introduce uh, Isabel Howen. And Isabel has been a, a great friend to the center over the past many years. And we were actually able to walk the center together and, and, and see our therapeutic preschool, our clinic and outpatient mental health clinic, um, our special education school, you know, in action, in, in real moments. And uh, that was such a, a wonderful privilege, all of us who work here and, and to share that experience um, with Isabel. And she's now on to be executive director now, a, a recent, um, uh, kind of a recent uh, focus for her and responsibility as, as executive director of the Stanford Accelerator for Learning, which is a Stanford-wide initiative, uh, really critical to connect researchers, cross-discipline, bids research practice policy with the focus of quality and equity and scalable learning experiences for, for all learners. Um, she also as if that wasn't enough, you know. Um, she comes from being a founder partner of Imaginable Futures, which was a venture of the Ameliard 
uh, group uh, philanthropic investment as you know, for the firm of eBay founder, PR Midyard, his wife, Pam, that was crucial. I mean, they, the initiatives in terms of education, the portfolio, the team that they led really impacted millions of learners all across the country and beyond. Um, as a frequent comp- contributor to Forbes, Edge Search Publications, and a wonderful small talk. So that's an ongoing uh, weekly newsletter um, that we really encourage you to, to look into. Of the many awards, just there's a couple ones we want to highlight, which is the 2021 Global Mind Ed Inclusive Leader. That was so touching, I know, for for Isabel in early childhood education, so meaningful. And 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 one of the 100 inspiring women from the Harvard Business School. Um, And of course, no no discussion is complete without Sesame Street. So here we are with young children and Grover, and she got to star with Grover. Um, on Sesame Street, an early childhood innovation. Um, so she brings all that along with that MBA from Harvard Business School, all for the reason of helping young children. Um, and uh, so I'm just delighted that you're going to hear directly from Isabel, and, and Isabel's going to help facilitate our, our wonderful uh, um, guest today in Pam and Dana. So, Isabel? Thank you, Jimmy, for those very nice words. Um, just sending up the, uh, the slides as well. Yeah, thank you, Jimmy, for uh, your extraordinary leadership uh, at the Lori Center uh, in service of uh, children and families. It has been, you know, I've been a, a really um, big admirer of your work for, for a long time and um, very grateful on this special day today to, to be with you and the team um, in celebrating the work that you do um, um, and also thinking together about what it means to be um, May 11, uh, 2023, uh, National, Awareness, National Children's Awareness Day. And I have two hopes today that I would like everyone to live with. One is that we don't need a National Children's Awareness Day next year or in the next few years, because we have, uh, and this is my second hope, because we have all moved from awareness to, to action. With that, um, I uh, wanted to uh, welcome everyone this afternoon or this evening for those of you uh, either on the West Coast like myself, uh, still early in the afternoon for those of you on the East Coast, it's uh, starting to be evening time. Uh, What we'll do this afternoon together or evening together, we'll uh, um, uh, review very briefly um, the state of children's mental health and um, who are our helpers and how we can lift them up. And then we'll hear from two leading voices, um, um, Pam Cantor and Dana Winters. And then we'll open to Q&A. So if you have questions throughout the presentations, please use the Q&A tab on the Zoom uh, function. So exactly three years ago, uh, I had written this piece in Ed Search. It was May 30th, 2020, so almost exactly three years ago. Uh, and the name of this piece was The Next Pandemic uh, Mental Health, where I had framed um, that we were uh, you know, in the middle of uh, clearly a major health crisis that was turning into an economic crisis. Um, and then we had a very clear signs that it was turning into, into a mental health crisis. And in many ways, I was both uh, correct and wrong. Uh, wrong because the mental health crisis in our children had started well before um, uh, the health crisis. Um, uh, the chart on the left is from um, the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation that just issued this really phenomenal report on the state of uh, health in our children uh, a few days ago. And they have they, they are showing this clear trend line that's um, not a great trend line, but that shows also that the state of mental health preceded um, uh, COVID. Um, 
Uh, so the sources of that crisis are well preceding that major shock that we all experienced together. And I will also in some ways correct because some of those trend lines that we are all seeing are also a result of the pandemic. Um, and I will share on a personal basis that I have um, uh, two, two daughters, uh, one in middle school and one in high school. So uh, some of those two stats that I will share feel very personal uh, on the right hand side. Um, those are um, recent surveys of high schoolers. Um, and it shows that effectively almost 60% of high school girls have now persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. Um, or this is the way they felt during this past year. And one in three uh, high school girls, no, or nearly one in three, so the, the exact number is 30%, have seriously considered attempting suicide. Um, so this, this both field of personal and one in three is just an extraordinary high number uh, showing the magnitude of our mental health uh, crisis in our children. But today we are here to speak about the helpers in those children's lives. And um, to me, there are three um, fundamental groups of helper. One is parent, two is educators, and then a third broader group of community members. So for parents, um, 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 Dr. Phil Fisher at Stanford, who is a terrific colleague at the Stanford Center on Early Childhood, tracks um, child and parent well-being, and he's been tracking this, those data since the inception of uh, the pandemic. And you can see some of those trend lines um, with a meaningful peak between uh, pre-pandemic and now where we are as well as a very clear um, um, connection between both the child and the parent well-being. So mental well-being is really bi-directional. Um, the mental health of all children and adults are deeply intertwined. The second group is educators. And um, unfortunately, our educator workforce at the moment is also not doing well, and I'm sure um, um, you know, I know that Pam and uh, Dana will speak more about it, but recent data from um, uh, dear friends at the Yale School of Medicine shows show that 56% of uh, early child care providers have diagnosable um, levels of depression, uh, which um, is obviously has, has been shown to have very uh, direct impact on the children. And then the third group of helpers is a community. And uh, here on the left, I, I was looking at this graph very recently from um, someone in the UK, but I think the pictures is, is very, very similar in the US. Um, this person was showing uh, how social networks have um, become sh smaller and smaller around kids. So the larger um, uh, potato, if I may call it that way, uh, is uh, was was our great grandfather, uh, where it showed like a very big radius around a child, where the child was allowed to walk about six miles to go fishing, and then a generation la later, that that's a smaller circle, and then the circle becomes smaller and smaller, and then we are today where. Um, you know, the son of this uh, particular writer is now eight, and uh, the the circles of that. A uh, young child has become really now in terms of uh, the ability of this child to uh, connect with others. And we have other data that um, that, uh, that substantiate that uh, that nicely nice visu visualization of how social fabric has been deteriorating uh, on play. Uh, a child today, for example, spends 50% less time playing outdoors than 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 their parents or than a, a generation before. With that, it's now my, dis and with those brief words of introduction and setting the stage on the discussion, uh, now it is my really distinct privilege to introduce our two uh, keynote speakers. First, um, Pamela Counter, uh, also known by me as Pam. Um, 
has been a practitioner in a child and adolescent psychiatry for, um, for, for decades. She's also an author, a thought leader on the human potential and the science of learning and development and um, on educational equity. In the aftermath of uh, September 11, she started this phenomenal nonprofit organization that I've uh, long admired uh, called Turnaround for Children that translates scientific insights into tools, services in school environments and in, um, in families that help educators establish the right conditions for all students, for all learners to thrive. Uh, last year, uh, Dr. Cantor authored two, um, uh, two academic publications. One that I have to say is literally on my bedside, um, uh, and I keep referring to it. I, I was meeting with Pam recently, and I was telling her, I was literally reciting by heart some of those pages of her book. Um, it's called The Whole Child Development, Learning and Thriving, an exceptional compilation of research on uh, the science of learning and development. She also offered the science of learning and development uh, as another um, um, uh, amazing landmark uh, uh, book for the field. She is a featured contributor to um, uh, uh, a series from Edutopia called How Learning Happens which has been probably viewed by many of you because it's been viewed 15 million times already and counting. She also offers a, a, a blog called Whole Kids Thriving and um, speaks on many, uh, many, many big stages. She's a governing partner of the Science of Learning and Development Alliance uh, with the Brookings Institution. And she's a commissioner of the Learning 2025 Commission of the American Association of school superintendents. It is my pleasure to uh, welcome Pam Cantor. Then we'll hear from Dana Winters, another giant in the field. Uh, so Dana is the uh, executive director of the Fred Rogers Institute. She's also a faculty at St. Vincent College. She has deep experience in applied research. She interviewed prisoners. She shadowed crossing guards in prison environments. She observed Head Start teachers, uh, and she developed many coaches and partnered with educators in early childhood, uh, in early childhood systems over many years. She has um, done research as a co-principal uh, investigator and program evaluator for multiple NSF early childhood research and led many, many foundation and government grants to improve early childhood systems and family engagement practices. I also really love that um, Dana has extended her knowledge and practice to the global um, early childhood um, a field. She also serves as a UNESCO faculty fellow in children and youth studies. So we will hear first from uh, Pam Cantor and then from Dana Winters. And then at the conclusion of, um, of Dana's presentation, we will open it up to questions um, from the audience. Please help me welcome uh, Pamela Cantor and Dana Winters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabel. That was an incredibly generous introduction and I am thrilled to be with you all today. How did Serena Williams become Serena Williams? Or Mae Jemison become the first black woman astronaut? How does each of us become who we become? The passion to understand this is what has animated my life and work. So let's think about the human embryo. Everything it will ever need to grow into a whole adult human is there. And then these magnificent and fierce growth processes open up and guide the embryo 
So it becomes an infant and then a child. This is biologically and psychologically true about all of us. We are wired for development and growth in the context of relationship. In other words, it is the dynamic connection between humans in relationship that is what causes life to unfold and learning to flourish. Attachment, which is one of the core principles that guides the work of the Lurie Center, well, we're gonna unpack the significance and the biology of attachment and relationships in the lives of children today. To do that, I'm gonna start with a personal story because for me, it all began in med school. I was not destined for med school. I had known trauma as a child. I was sexually molested and abused by an uncle and my parents couldn't face it. But I did find this one person, a psychiatrist who saw me so differently than everybody else. He told me I was a pearl in an oyster, not this ugly, dirty thing that I thought I was. So you can imagine the day I walked into his office and I told him, I'm going to be a doctor. And he said, of course you are. And I wondered, did he not know that I had been an art major in college? I had not taken any science or math courses. So my journey into medicine began in GED classes, in math and in algebra and in chemistry, then pre-med courses. And that was like a mountain of prerequisites. But despite the hurdles, I did well, enough to be waitlisted at 11 schools and accepted at one, Cornell University Medical School. So at 28 years old, I began. But the night before that first day of med school, I noticed something happening to my voice. First some crackling as if I were getting cold, but then by late evening, my voice was gone. Not laryngitis, I was mute. I was up the entire night in a panic saying, I can't go, this is impossible, this will be so humiliating. And in the early morning though, I grabbed a clipboard and I wrote on it, I am Pam and I don't have a voice today. My new classmates introduced themselves to me by writing on my clipboard. And as I sat down for that very first lecture, I, learned, I looked around me and I was struck. I was one of only a few women in my class and yes, older. So I can't imagine what my classmates thought of me, the woman with the clipboard, but they didn't embarrass me. They helped me get through it. That night, I drove to my therapist's office. I couldn't call him because I had no voice. I had to see him. And I pointed to my throat and I said, what is this? He said it was a severe stress-induced reaction to the experience of that first day of med school. But then he looked at me and he took a long pause and he said, you still don't believe you belong there. And he explained the power of stress to frighten, to shut us down, to ensure that we take no risks, to avoid feeling like an imposter and how powerful and excruciating that can be when you don't believe you're worthy of something and you don't believe you belong. And of course I asked, will I get my voice back and how long will it take? And he said, you know, it takes two weeks to get used to anything new like this. I thought he might've been making that up, but I trusted him and I started counting down the days going to class with my clipboard and feeling myself settle in. And yes, in just under two weeks, my voice came back. But here are the two big things I learned. From my therapist, I learned that trust is the antidote to, to stress. It is, it literally melts it away. And I learned that belonging would become the most powerful antidote to things like fear, including the fear of being seen as an imposter. I would come to learn the biology of all of this in med school, but I also learned I wasn't alone in my feelings. It turns out one of my classmates and my partner in my clinical rotations was future astronaut, Mae Jemison. We shared many things, but by far one of the most important things was about whether we belonged. Our reasons were different, but the feelings were the same. 
So med school turned out to be this amazing universe of its own where mysteries were unpacked every single day. I learned about the complex biologic mechanisms that explain all the things that we're able to do. And it wasn't just the obvious things, like how our hearts and lungs work. It was also how we love, how we attach, how we nurture, and how we become conscious of ourselves. And most of all, how we heal when things go wrong. So I'll never forget the moment in a med school lecture when I heard this, that there are 20,000 genes in the human genome, yet in our lifetime, fewer than 10% will ever be expressed. And I remember thinking, well, what determines what's in that 10% and its context, the environments, experiences, and relationships in our lives, the risks, but also the opportunities in development and learning sit inside this one profoundly important point, that there is no separation of nature and nurture, biology and environment, or brain and behavior, only a collaboration between them. Genes, I learned, are chemical followers. They're little packages of protein with lots of receptors on their surface that are triggered by our environments and relationships into action. So this means genes are not the drivers of who we become. Context drives the expression of our genes. And by context, we are speaking of relationships, like the one I had with my therapist, who taught me that trauma is not destiny. And the relationship I had with my classmates, including May, who had my back and would not let me give up. It is about our families, our communities, our colleagues, our teachers, our friends, and the safety and belonging we experience from these relationships along the way. This is what propels our growth forward with some of the greatest opportunities for change and development, and you know this, coming in early childhood. Development and learning sciences tell an optimistic story about what's possible, especially for our young people, because human brains and bodies are malleable to experience, because the Human brain is a dynamic living structure made up of tissue that is the most susceptible to change from experience of any tissue in the human body. And the brain is malleable over time. Most of its growth happens after we're born. So there are multiple opportunities to catch up along the way. Now this was surely my story, but there are really three things I want you to remember about brain development the astounding malleability of the human brain, experience-dependent growth, and the overwhelming importance of context. Stress is the most common naturally occurring example of negative context. When we experience stress, that hormone cortisol floods our brains and our bodies, and it's intense when it happens. And in my case, this is what caused me to become mute that night before med school started. But if the stress is mild or tolerable, it can be adaptive. It makes us alert and sharp, and it helps us prepare for an event like a test or a performance. But cortisol can do a lot of damage to the structures in the limbic system, especially when they are still developing. And this is because adversity doesn't just happen to children. It happens inside their brains and bodies through the biologic mechanism of stress. But thankfully, that's not the end of the story because there is a big upside when we turn to another hormone, the hormone oxytocin. And oxytocin is produced only one way, human connection. It generates the feelings of trust, love, attachment, and belonging. It sets up the conditions for curiosity and exploration. This is the state where our minds can open up to possibility. It's a state of readiness to absorb something new, where creativity can blossom because we don't fear embarrassment or ostracism. A state where feedback is not only welcome because there's trust, we're drawn to it, like, like to food if we're hungry or water if we're thirsty. We go toward it, we have to. This is what the experience of curiosity is. You've had it. Picture it, think about yourself in a curious state of mind. Chemically speaking, 
Curiosity is most like a biological drive that's seeking satisfaction. It could be new knowledge that we're introduced to and we want more of it. It could be mastery of a new skill and a teacher helps us see that what we want to do is actually within reach. Think of the look on a child's face when that happens. Yes, they say, I did it. The chemical in charge of all of this is a neurotransmitter called dopamine. This is our dopamine pathway. It is our salience and reward pathway and it's released when we're introduced to something that matters to us a lot, often by someone who matters to us a lot. And we want more of it. We want to move toward it. We feel satisfied. We're rewarded for our curiosity and we want more. Think about the state when you and your children are lost in a book and you don't know where the time went. Think about a time when someone showed you something you didn't believe you could do and then you did it. That feeling, that rush, that's dopamine. So oxytocin sets up the conditions, the atmosphere where curiosity is possible, but it is dopamine that rewards us for those explorations. This cocktail, oxytocin and dopamine, this is the cocktail that we want to set up in all of our learning settings because we want curiosity and engagement to flourish. That's what will set us up for the fullest expression of a student's potential. Oxytocin is important in other ways too. It hits all of the same structures as cortisol, but oxytocin is the more powerful hormone, especially at the level of the cell because it protects us from the damaging effects of cortisol. This is why, and this is so important, the effects of trauma are reversible. Not the events, but the feelings and emotions are. This is why trauma is not destiny. And why when we speak about the human relationship, we're not just talking about being nice to a child. We're speaking about a connection that is built through presence and trust, the kind that can make you believe something about yourself you couldn't have imagined without this person's presence in your life. This is what my doctor did for me. So it makes me completely crazy when people talk about relationship as the soft stuff. Our brains are electrical structures and electrical structures need an energy source and that energy source is human connection. And as the brain gets increasingly wired, and this is something called Hebb's law, neurons that fire together, wired together. And as this happens, we become able to do increasingly complex things like reading or riding a bike or building a robot. If you take a look at this PET scan of a brain reading, look at the different structures lighting up. Sight, hearing, comprehension, expression, all of those different structures getting connected through the experience of reading. And it is those connections that will produce more and more complex skills as we grow. And the power source, human connection. The message in the science is clear. We need a new framework for student development and learning mapped to the way the brain grows and learns. A design that nurtures belief and confidence and provides for that fierce sense of belonging. So no student settles for anything less than their highest aspirations a design that combines positive developmental relationships, environments filled with safety and belonging, rich, meaningful learning experiences so students discover what they're capable of, the intentional development of the critical habits, skills, and mindsets that all successful learners have, and integrated student supports. Linda Darling Hammond with the Learning Policy Institute and I with my organization, Turnaround for Children, we co-authored a playbook called Design Principles for Schools that goes into detail and shows how to operationalize these five elements in any learning setting. This playbook is filled with stories and videos elevating where this is taking place today and the tools and resources that can make this possible in any setting. But to bring this to life for you, I'm going to show you one short video from the series that Isabel mentioned. It was 34 uh, videos 
from the How Learning Happens series that we did with George Lucas's team in Edutopia. And yes, it has had over 15 million views. And the one you're about to see is the favorite. Strong relationships are central to the learning process. Yeah, interesting. The science of learning and development tells us that we need to create learning environments for children to become attached to school and to the adults and other children in it. When children have experiences of closeness and consistency and trust, oxytocin is released. Oxytocin has many, many positive effects on the development of the brain. So when we think about a relationship, we're talking about a child having an experience strong enough to release the hormone oxytocin. You all have done outstanding work. If you're in a positive emotional space, if you feel good about yourself, your teacher, that actually opens up the opportunity for more learning. Good to see. So now we have something else to consider as we think about what we've experienced over the past three years. The barrage of bad news of how the losses and the disruptions of this pandemic have harmed the mental health of children. A recent Pew Research Strong study found that about 40% of parents, I think the number could even be higher based on what Isabel said, they are worried, very worried about their children's emotional well being and the risk that their kids are struggling with anxiety and depression. I wonder if you know, though, that emotional wellness and emotional illness actually live on a continuum. Many people don't think of it that way. They think that emotional illness is something you either have or you don't. That's actually not true. It is more like shades of gray, not black and white. The human mind and body are living structures and every single cell and structure that we are made of can get frayed. It can get worn out because of the effects of cumulative stress. And cumulative stress can move us on this continuum from health and wellness toward illness. If I talk to you about a physical activity like sports and what happens, to overwork knees, hips, or shoulders from running or basketball or soccer. The cumulative stress on any body part is something we call allostatic load. This is about the impact of stress on any living system. For a while, the body adapts to the stress and adaptation can sometimes be a good thing. And if we take care of our bodies with sleep, nutrition, stretching, coaching, wellness practices like meditation, we can prevent problems, increase our performance because we have taken care of ourselves in the most important ways. But if we don't protect our human structures, they will wear out and then we can suffer an injury and we'll have to recover. When cumulative stress hits the brain, think of the flood of that hormone cortisol and we don't do things to offset that stress, we start, <clears throat> we start to move from health toward illness. We can lose focus, get cranky and anxious, and symptoms like depression can appear. This is what is going on today for all of us and for our kids in historic numbers, including our little ones who may not really fully understand what's going on around them, but who do feel it when the people they love are under stress. So I have one final thought to leave you with. If a Mozart, a Martin Luther King, or a Mae Jemison existed in a classroom designed the way many of our classrooms and learning settings are still designed, it's more than likely we would not know that they are there. We have not yet gotten to the right answers about human learning, human performance or unlocking human potential or preventing the effects of stress because we have not been asking and answering enough of the hard questions. What are the forces 
that define the expression of a child's potential, the developmental range of what they can do and the acquisition of greater and greater competencies, no matter where a child begins. And what experiences and environments and relationships are necessary to produce those results? How did I become me? How did May become May? Well, it starts with this mind-blowing insight that context and relationships grow the brain, trigger the expression of our genes, harness the brain's astonishing malleability to unleash the potential in each and every young person. For May Jemison, the sky was never the limit. And we know it shouldn't be for anyone. Thank you all so much for letting me be with you today. I don't know about anybody else, but the lights just turned off in my office because I was so mesmerized by what Dr. Cantor was sharing. Uh, very grateful to be with you also. My name is Dana Winters. I'm the executive director of the Fred Rogers Center. And for those of you who may not have grown up calling him Fred, Fred is Mr. Rogers from Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, who graced our television screens for over 30 years and continues to uh, do the same today. We're located just outside of Pittsburgh, and we were developed by Fred to uh, be a research and programmatic group that could carry on his legacy after he had died. So we are celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. Um, surprisingly, it's been 20 years since Fred's death in February of 2003. Our work is um, it's to really build upon much of the science that Dr. Cantor just talked about. Um, we aren't in the business of working directly with children, but we are, we like to say, in the business of helping the helpers. So we advance the legacy of Fred Rogers by investing in the strengths of the caring adults, both families, educators, and the helpers who are supporting the healthy development of children. Now, when we use the word helper, uh, it's out of a great sense of respect um, for Fred for Fred's mother, and also for the many people that we have had the honor of serving throughout the years. If you know the quote, look for the helpers from Fred Rogers, tends to be a pretty popular one. But that is actually something that his mother shared with him when he was a young boy. The story goes that when he was a, a young boy and he saw scary things happening, he asked his mother what he should do. And his mother told him, when scary things are happening, look for the helpers, because you'll always find people helping. Now, the story goes on. We, we typically hear that, that little part of it when we have sound clips. But the story goes on, and Fred explains a little bit more about why he thinks we look for helpers. And in Fred's words, we look for the helpers, because when we see people helping, we know there is hope. So in our work, we've dedicated our efforts in extending Fred's legacy to the helpers who provide us with so much hope. The helpers are those caring adults who are supporting the healthy development, not only of children, but of families and entire communities. I thought tonight, since our work focuses so much on helpers, I'd share a couple of ideas and thoughts that I've learned along the way from being able to share time and space with so many wonderful helpers who have shown me so much hope. So what is it that we can learn from helpers about building and maintaining the connections that Dr. Cantor just talked about? Uh, little aside note, I didn't know what she was going to talk about. So this actually works out yeah. pretty well. <laughs> so the number one thing I think that I've learned from helpers is that having at least one really matters. Now, the concept of at least one comes to us from the research around resilience, uh, which is relatively young 
if we were to talk in research years. But about a decade ago, the Harvard Center on Developing Child put a, a meta-analysis together to help us through the decades of research on resilience. And in the end, they established that the most common finding across all of these many research studies was that children who had been experiencing a whole host of adverse experiences in their lives and trauma, what was something that they all had in common that when they ended up doing well? Well, it was that they had at least one stable and committed relationship with a supportive parent, caregiver, or other adult. That's what I mean when I refer to it as at least one. Having at least one person who is there for you in times of trouble, who, in Dr. Cantor's words, really deeply connects and attaches mm -hmm. and is there to show you that you are more than your circumstances right now. We get asked quite often what Fred Rogers said about resilience. I, right now, am currently sitting atop a, an archive of almost 23,000 items from Fred's life. All of the scripts, the, you know, some puppets, some sneakers, the things you would expect. But also as many writings, all of his learning from his time in school. And not in any one of those documents does he use the term resilience. But he had a pretty fancy way of talking about the importance of human relationships that I think gets to the point when we're talking about resilience. Then when things happen, that are traumatic, when things happen that are adverse experience in our lives, and we're able to grow from those, we're able to connect with others who help us to do well on the other side of those experiences. Well, Fred reminds us that it's human relationships that are primary in all of living. When gusty winds blow and shake our lives, if we know that people care about us, we may bend with the wind, but we won't break. It's Fred's fancy way of talking about resilience, essentially. That if we have people who care about us, people to buffer those gusty winds, that we may bend with those winds, but we won't break. Now, oftentimes the work that we do with educators in particular, but anyone who is helping the development of children and young people, they want to stop the gusty winds. I, I'm one of those people. I would love to stop the gusty winds. Not always is stopping the gusty winds a part of our area of influence. We might not be able to stop all of the gusty winds that are affecting our children and young people. We can be the people who stand up to show that they are cared about and to maybe help them to bend with the wind, but not break. In our world, when we're dealing in practice, that's what we remind others about being that at least one, to be able to show up and help people bend with the wind, but not break. The second um, thing that I've learned from helpers and a little bit from Fred along the years is that being able to support one another means acknowledging that each one of us is far more than just one thing. Especially in today's society, it's very easy to look at someone and think you know everything about them by maybe how they present themselves, a simple conversation. But we are so much more than any one thing. When we all experienced the uh, pausing of March of 2020, many of these helpers we were working with in terms of their spaces in early childhood and youth development. And all of a sudden we shifted from these in-person connections and relationships to a space that was very different, a space that required us to really be innovative in order to maintain, sustain, and grow interactions and relationships. The number one thing I noticed from those that we were supporting and that we were keeping in touch with through that time was that they never stopped. They kept on going and they found new ways to connect. They found new ways to be sure that they could be there for the children and families 
and communities that they had been supporting. We saw that connections were possible whenever we try to make them even through difficulties and limitations. And it showed us that not only are we more than one thing, but when we acknowledge that we are more than one thing, we can find that there is more than one way to be together, to help one another, to be that buffer that helps us to bend but not break. The way that Fred talked about it, he gave a speech to uh, the a group of pediatricians, so the American Pediatric Association. This would have been in the early 1980s. And he told all of them that what's been important in my un understanding of myself and others is the fact that each one of us is so much more than any one thing. A sick child is much more than his or her sickness. A person with a disability is much, much more than a handicap. A pediatrician is more than a medical doctor. You're much more than your job description or your age or your income or your output. Oftentimes as helpers, the work that we do goes underappreciated, underseen, undervalued. And it's sometimes hard to see ourselves as more than just one thing. But if we are helping children to do that in every moment, being able to acknowledge and appreciate everything they are bringing to us, we must allow that same perspective when we look inside or toward one another, that as colleagues, as peers, as supporters of others, we can acknowledge that each one of us is far more than just one thing. The final thought I'd like to share with you tonight is the work that we've done with helpers and being able to see educators and camp counselors and youth care workers and child life specialists, and the list goes on and on, pour out and give so much of themselves to children and families and communities and young people. I'm reminded more and more that our helpers need that same support and appreciation. Because when we consider a child serving space, oftentimes we start with the health and well being of that child. If we simplify our model to look at the importance of relationships within communities, within an ecosystem, we may start with a child. And our hope for that child is that that child has very strong relationships within the family. And we can define family very broadly, but we hope that those relationships are beginning from very early days. We also know that children are going to form relationships and have developmental interactions with helpers outside of the family. And that takes shape in a number of ways and continues to grow as children continue to grow. Oftentimes we look at this picture and think if children have the relationships they need, then we're all set. And arguably this is the most important part of our picture, making sure that our children have what they need. But if we continue to build out this picture a little bit more, the relationships between the adults who are supporting children Sometimes we think of these as family engagement relationships, but a true relationship, not just transactional, but one that's built upon trust and respect for a common hope, which is the growth and healthy development of children. This relationship is incredibly important. It's a relationship that as a mom, I value every single day. In fact, I've had three calls from the nurse just today. I feel like I've got a very strong personal connection to her. But these connections only help to drive the development of children if we are all working together toward that same productive, positive goal. And none of this happens in isolation. Our hope is that families are working within a community of support, that they have what they need to be able to be the best family they can be, to do the hard work of caregiving, being able to lean on one another for support, maybe in the shape of 
extended family, neighbors, new friends. Maybe sometimes it's formal family supports. But families need help along the way to be able to develop relationships with one another, with other helpers, and with children. We do a really great job of thinking about many of these parts. The next part, though, is that we don't always think about how important it is to add that same community for our helpers, that sometimes our best helpers need that same community of support, a community of practice, a place where they can share their challenges, their successes, their wonderings in a place that is safe to make mistakes, safe to share, safe to explore. And that's how helpers become better helpers. And of course, we can't ignore how important that community of peers happens to be as children grow. But I'm reminded more and more through field work, through our work with helpers, and even in my own household, that children are catching how to interact and relate to others by what they're seeing their adults do around them. Which means each one of these touch points here, whether it's directly with the child or not, is having an effect on how they see themselves and how they see their future relationships. Now, this might be a very pretty and oversimplified picture, but also I think it's important to point out that during and after COVID, our helpers may not be feeling this picture quite as much as they're feeling this picture. The more and more I talk with educators and social service and human service providers, the more I'm hearing how isolated they feel. Many of them are feeling under attack. Many of them feel like they have no one to turn to for support. So while Fred Rogers reminded us to think of children first, if you ever have anything to do in the life of a child, listen to the child, learn about them, learn from them, think of the children first. My request to all of you is we think of children first, but let's think of helpers next. Listen to them, learn about them, learn from them. I'm becoming increasingly more convinced that we won't make a lasting impact on children if we're skipping over the needs of the adults who are caring for them. We know that our adults and our helpers in particular, they need help too. It is very difficult to do the moment to moment and day to day work of helping when you don't feel worthy of doing that helping. I was meeting with a group of higher ed faculty um, from the United States and Canada recently, and we were talking about the importance of demonstrating and supporting the development of self-worth among college students. And I had one participant who typically would engage very actively in the work that we were doing, and she was very quiet. And at the end, she said, Dr. Winters, I don't know how to help my students feel worthy when I don't feel worthy of teaching them. We have to stand up to help our helpers. And to do that, we need to do what the best helpers are doing for the development of children and families. Wrap them in an environment of support, in an environment of relationships, one where they can continue to grow and stretch and hope for what is to come. Now, we may not have the ability to touch every part of this picture, but we do have influence somewhere. And just as the still pond begins to ripple when it starts to rain, if each one of us is touching our touch point upon this picture, eventually it'll ripple all the way out and the entire picture will be covered with support and appreciation to strengthen our helpers, our families, and the development of our children. Now, People don't expect me to enter a conversation and not talk about Fred. It kind of comes with the territory and the red sweater that's behind me. And I wanted to end my time, not with my voice, but with 
uh, a token of gratitude directly from Fred Rogers. It's one of the joys of my job is that I get to travel around and carry around uh, some messages that you may not have seen before. We know that Fred didn't talk very often to adults. Uh, he was talking directly to children through the program, though if you watch it as a grown adult, you can catch some things there too. However, he did talk to our country in times of tragedy. Um, if I had a nickel for every time somebody called me and said, what would Fred say about a global pandemic? Um, I wouldn't be in front of you right now. I'd probably be on a beach in Tahiti. Uh, it has happened quite often. We are used to looking to Fred in times of challenge. He recorded his final um, recording actually was on the one year anniversary of September 11th. Uh, we didn't know this would be one of the final times we saw him on video. Um, he had a very brief um, known illness and died a few months later. But in this video, uh, I share it because he is expressing his gratitude to those who step up and support children, especially in times of challenge. I thought it might be a good bridge to our questions tonight to end with that same token of gratitude to all of you who continue to show up and provide so much hope to children and be the helpers now that we were told to look for when we were much younger. So here's a little note from Fred. You know, it happens so often. I walk down the street and someone 20 or 30 or 40 years old will come up to me and say, you are Mr. Rogers, aren't you? And then they tell me about growing up with the neighborhood and how they're passing on to the children they know what they found to be important in our television work, like expressing their feelings through music and art and dance and sports and drama and computers and writing and and invariably we end our little time together with a hug. I'm just so proud of all of you who have grown up with us. And I know how tough it is some days to look with hope and confidence on the months and years ahead. But I would like to tell you what I often told you when you were much younger. I like you just the way you are. And what's more, I'm so grateful to you for helping the children in your life to know that you'll do everything you can to keep them safe and to help them express their feelings in ways that will bring healing in many different neighborhoods. It's such a good feeling to know that we're lifelong friends. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Pam and Dana, for both um, hopeful words. Um, and Jimmy had started us with uh, this um, expression that we use at the Lori Center of a big hug. And that's uh, exactly where I am. Like, I feel like I need to give the two of you a big hug um, for these uh, amazing and inspiring words. So now we'll turn to uh, Q&A. So I see that a few questions have started uh, to come up, but please uh, please feel free to add some. We also had uh, a few that had been asked uh, at registration. So I will start with some of those um, that had come um, with one very interesting one from um, Michelle Richards um, about um, steps that you would recommend for a school. Uh, that may be dealing with children who are suspected to have behavioral um, challenges. Uh, and Pam, I will uh, ask you the question first, given your um, experience with a turnaround. I think that one of the most important things that we need to do in schools has a lot to do with what I was talking about when I spoke about, I used the word context. And, and what we've learned at, at Turnaround is that if you go at the issues that kids have on a child by child basis, first you run the risk 
of pathologizing and labeling children. And one of the things we've seen is that if you increase the health of the environment itself, and with a very particular attention to relationships and children's sense of belonging, what you often find is that a lot of things that are behavioral issues begin to melt away because children see their place in, in the environment that you've created. So the, the main one big point here is, is around how you structure an environment for relationship safety and belonging. Bella, do you want to build on this from your perspective? Um, um, only to agree. Um, you know, some of the work that we've done in schools has been to um, help teachers to reframe and to understand what relationship-based approaches are to, um, especially to children's behavioral patterns. So if we're um, facing maybe a behavioral challenge within the classroom, to stop and consider what is a relationship-based way of approaching this child, to, to sit back and think of, um, you know, we look at non-pejorative reasons as to why this behavior may be happening. So not something like this is a bad kid or um, being able to say, hmm, maybe this is a bad day because of a number of reasons. And to be able to rely on the relationship and connection that is present either with yourself and that child or with another adult in the classroom to be able to rely on that relationship as a, a mechanism for addressing behavior and being of support to what that behavior is signaling. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we we have two two related questions which are um, very connected to to this prior one um, uh, that have to do with um, discipline um, and so the balance of rewards punishment or the risks of uh, using rewards and punishment with learners um, as well as um, the other question was asking about the results of too strict rules for children in schools or at home. Um, so how, how and, and Pam, I know you have um, written extensively uh, about this. Mm -hmm. So would you mind maybe commenting on recommendations of things that, uh, how to think about um, um, yeah, this notion of uh, discipline that has traditionally been be used in, uh, in education or in, in family context? You know, I, I think that I want to pick up on something that Dr. Winters already said in my way of answering this. Um, there is a practice that we use at Turnaround called the two by 10. So if somebody, if a child is acting out in some way, a teacher takes a relationship-based approach as Dr. Winters talked about and decides to have two minutes of conversation with that child every day for 10 days. And guess what happens? Instead of sending that child to the principal's office or whatever the analogous gesture would be, what we find is giving attention to a child through listening in this two by 10, the behaviors go away. So what we're using is a very concrete example of a relationship-based approach. This is really, really, really well studied. It is not damaging to kids' self-esteem. In fact, it does the exact opposite. It gives the right kind of attention and the behaviors stop. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. A um, question that has come um, from Julia Wessel uh, on online. Um, is um, on helping the helpers, but specifically uh, BIPOC helpers um, who may not only experience um, 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 some of the burdens that we heard about, but also the you know, racism and racial um, uh, aggression. So Dana, I would love to turn to you on that question. What are, what are, you, what are you seeing and how can programs best support um, BIPOC helpers. One thing I will say is that the, the work that we're doing, particularly in early childhood, 
there is um, an overrepresentation of of BIPOC educators. Um, so being bringing a, a very very large awareness, front of mind awareness of the lived experiences of those who are the the frontline educators and helpers right now is extremely important. Um, we are very careful. This is something we actually learned from Fred. Um, we're very careful to make sure that we do not present ourselves as experts when we are working with helpers. Um, we may have some experiences that we can draw from, but uh, in our work, we strive to listen first, which means we try our best to learn the lived experiences of those that we want to support, um, particularly those who have lived experiences that are very different from our own. So when we are entering into to places of work, um, we listen first. We do our best to make sure that our teams are representative of those that we are supporting. Um, and we find the ways together to be able to make sure that they, um, as helpers, feel that they are appreciated and supported to do the work that they do. Um, that it is not us coming in with any type of model that is inflexible, but rather one is a model that is able to adapt to the needs of those that we're supporting. Um, it's been not always easy. I will um, absolutely admit that um, because Sometimes there are um, very, very deep biases within some of the tools that we are looking to use that we must be aware of as well, um, in addition to the, the resources necessary to be able to create change in certain environments, um, personal resources and systemic. That's uh, a big challenge that we face in supporting early childhood right now is the dramatic um, shift of pay especially dependent upon who that educator happens to be. Uh, so there are certain places where we are not able to make change, but we try to find the places where we can and to make that change together. Yeah, thank you, Dana. Um, I think we have time for maybe two, two more questions uh, and then we'll need to, to wrap up. Um, and I will uh, go and tackle this one, which seems very important around uh, parents uh, uh, who may um, need to have access to a therapist but are struggling right now to find one, what advice do you have for them? Um, um, you know, Pam, maybe maybe if you if I could start with you on on this um, on mm -hmm. this very 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 you know very practical and but very important question. You know, there isn't there really isn't an easy answer to this question. Um, we're at a really important inflection point if we think about ourselves as mental health practitioners, which I have been. Um, our whole orientation was around individual work with children or individual work with adults. And the numbers today tell us we cannot continue to operate that way. We are going to have to um, think through the issues of scale when we think about mental health work. Part of why I told you the story about the continuum from illness to wellness is because it opens up options for us in pursuing wellness. And I, I would advocate right now, before I would be hunting for a therapist, which there is a tremendous shortage of, the things that we can do to dramatically reduce stress and begin to get our own wellness under our own control is a really, really important thing to do. The second thing is that I have been really impressed with the amount of tele-mental health resources that are starting to be available. And I would really do some good research on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me turn to our final question, which is a beautiful one for you, Dana. Um, um, one of our attendees is asking for you to speak about the role of the wounded healer as they are becoming uh, or being asked to be a helper. 
And this is a question that I'm hearing a lot from uh, educators around us. Um, we'd be eager to hear your answer. <laughs> um, keeping an eye on time. Um, this is this is a something we're hearing a lot also in, um, you know, there's there are a couple of, of schools of thought that we've we've come to find here. Um, one is the um, being aware of your own journey toward helping, um, and also being aware of your limits of helping. Um, you know, we have started to look at, um, for instance, peer support models for college student mental health and well-being. And what we're learning is that some of our college students um, do not know the boundary of helping, and sometimes they overextend. And oftentimes we can see that um, with folks who have experienced their own journey through, um, and that can end up being um, not as helpful for either um, side. However, there's something really um, very compelling about being able to share uh, yourself and your story and being able to support those who may have walked a similar path. Um, so I, again, this is a much longer answer um, to a, a a very, I think, has become a much more complex question than has been previously. Um, but it's, it's, you know, I, I, I consistently um, am impressed with our helpers who are able to be able to stand in the face of all adversities, especially those who have been uh, those adversities that have been a part of their own histories. Thank you very much. Um, so this concludes our Q and A, and um, and uh, largely concludes our session uh, together. Uh, but before we um, we we depart, uh, I wanted to thank again um, Maureen Diamond, uh, Jimmy uh, Venza, uh, Alan Ezaghi, um, the Lori Center's Champions for Children. Um, beautiful hug to all of you, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Cantor and Dr. Winters uh, for your uh, remarkable remarks and inspiring remarks uh, and vision for a re relationship focused uh, context and of, of relationship for engaging families and building communities around young children. Uh, thank you, everyone who attended, and please join me to, to thank our uh, amazing uh, speakers. Thank you. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you.